Okay, for this video, I wanted to cover a simple example of how to complete IRS Form 4952, the Investment Interest Expense Deduction. So the sample fact pattern we're going to be working with here, we've got an individual taxpayer, uh, John Doe, and he has some investment income and expenses, and he has some interest that was charged on his brokerage account because he was trading on margin. So what we want to do is go through the Form 4952, go through his 1040, and the brokerage statement as well and see kind of how all these items align. So just high level, what's important with this form, when you have investment interest expense, you can only deduct a certain amount of expense to the extent you have investment income. So part of the task here is to compute how much of your income actually qualifies as investment income, and then the investment interest expense you have connected with that income can be deducted to the extent um, that you have earnings, right? So you can take an investment interest expense deduction in excess of what your net investment income is. Now, what is investment interest expense? Well, you have to borrow money and then use those proceeds to invest in other assets. You can't just borrow the money and use it to buy you know, personal property. So for example, if you have a credit card and you buy a TV with it and you get charged interest on the credit card, that's interest expense to you personally, certainly. Uh, but you did not use the proceeds from that credit card to go out and buy an income producing asset, right? There's no investment there. You just bought personally used property so you could sit at home and watch TV. Um, so the most common type of investment interest expense we see is with your brokerage account. So if you're trading on margin, uh, if you're trading futures, you're going to have some investment interest expense. And so that's the example we're going to be looking at here. So before we move through the rest of the turn, I want to look at the brokerage statement for John first. So if we look at his um, uh, statement here, this is a consolidated form 1099. Looks familiar. I mean, every, every broker has their own format, but for the most part, it's all got similar information, right? So uh, here's um, John's brokerage account. You can see here he's got some dividend income, $9 of ordinary and qualified dividends. We've got some capital gain distributions there of three, three bucks. And then if we move on here to the right, we see he traded some futures contracts. So we got 1256 contracts. Those are reported on form 6781. Uh, I'll include a link below if you wanna watch that video. And then we've also got uh, so sales proceeds here from the sale of stocks, right? So we sold uh, stocks proceeds at 40, uh, 2042, cost basis was 2022. So he's got a $461 gain there on the sale of those stocks and other securities. Now, if we scroll on down to the second page, we got some more information here as well. We can see that he had some interest income earned on the account. And then he also down here, this is where we find our interest. So of all these line items down here, you can see fees and expenses, margin interest. The margin interest charge on the account was $97 for the year. This is going to be our interest expense number for the period. Now, how much of that is going to be deductible? We'll get into that. Okay, so now if we have this information, let's look at how it was entered on the return so we can get kind of get our basis as far as uh, how the income information is reported first. So page one here, we can see the uh, dividend line item, all right, 3A and B, we've got our ordinary and qualified dividends of $9. And then on line 2B, we've got our interest income there of two. Then on line seven, we have our overall capital gain figure, right? So he had $4,114 in capital gain. And so if we jump over to the Schedule D, we can see what that breakout was. Remember, he sold stocks for a $460 gain, um, line items four and line items 11 have the sales um, from those futures contracts, right? So remember 1256 futures contracts are broken out between short term and long term, reported on 6781. So we've got the 1460 there, the 2193 there, and then he's got that capital gain distribution of $3 there. So the overall capital gain for the period was $4,114. Okay, so that's the overall investment income that uh, John earned during the year through that brokerage account. So now let's take a closer look at the 4952. Now, as I said, remember, you can only deduct investment interest to the extent you have investment income. So we complete part one, then we complete part two, and we find out whatever our expense deduction is. Part one, 
you see line item one there is the amount of interest expense paid during the year. There's that $97 figure, which is the margin interest that was reported on his consolidated 1099. Now line two is the disallowed investment interest from last year. Remember, if you have investment interest expense uh, that you can't deduct in the current period, you can carry forward that interest to future tax years. In this case, John didn't have any last year, so this line item is zero. But hypothetically, if last year he had some investment interest and he couldn't deduct it all, we would see a carry forward amount here reported on line two. Okay, so that's part one. Now part two, net investment income. How is this calculated? Now net investment income is not exactly what you might think it could be. So here's the line items, or here's broadly how this works. When you compute net investment income, you are only reporting interest income and then non-qualified dividend income. Note here that we have on line 4A, we've reported the, um, uh, we reported the dividend income and then the interest income, so the total was 11, and we are backing out, we're subtracting the amount of qualified dividends that are included on line 4A, so the net amount reported here is only $2 in interest. Also note that we're not reporting any of the capital gains here. Remember, we had over 4,000 in capital gains, so why are we not reporting that? Here's the issue. Qualified dividends and net capital gain from the sale of property held for investment is excluded from your investment income calculation when you complete this form. You do not include short-term, long-term capital gains. You do not include qualified dividend income. So that is why the end result here, after all of that investment income, we're only reporting $2 in net investment income. Now, here's what you could do. Now, careful planning has to be done here. It is possible to make an election to include qualified dividends and net capital gain in this calculation. The problem, though, is if you elect to include that income in your net investment income calculation, to increase this base so you can take more of an investment interest deduction. If you make that election, you do not get, get that lower qualified dividend tax rate. You do not get that lower capital gains tax rate. So this is the trade-off. Do you want to preserve the lower tax rates for qualified dividends and uh, capital gains? Or do you want to forgo those preferential tax rates to increase this net investment income amount and ultimately allow you to deduct more investment interest. That is a trade-off. The election, once it's made, it's permanent. You can't revoke it unless you get permission from the IRS. So be very, very careful before you start including capital gains here, uh, before you start including qualified dividend income here. Be very, very careful. Talk to your tax advisor about this. So here are the example we have. All of the investment income John has, the only amount that he can use as the ceiling uh, as far as the net investment income computation is going to be $2, and that's the interest income that he earned on that account. Now, part three is where we have the actual deduction. So the investment interest deduction, line seven, we start with the disallowed investment interest that's going to be carried forward to 22, um, and so that is effectively the difference between the total investment interest here on line three minus the net investment income, and that's our carry forward, right? The deduction is gonna be the smaller of line three or line six, in this case is two bucks. So effectively what's happening here is of all the investment interest he had, 97 bucks, he's only deducting $2 because that is the limit on his investment income for the year. $2 of interest in, and then $2 investment expense going out for tax purposes. So now where is this reported, the line eight number? Well, if we go back to his Schedule A, the investment interest expense item is reported on Schedule A as an itemized deduction. So if we scroll down to the interest section here, you'll see line nine, investment interest, attached 4952, there is our $2 figure. So the $2 gets rolled into um, his total itemized deduction amount, and then that is ultimately what's deducted on the tax return. Now, like with all itemized deductions, if you, have an, if you don't have enough itemized deductions to exceed the standard, then all of it's kind of lost anyway, right? It's more of a mood issue. But if you do itemized deductions for tax purposes and you have investment interest expense, you can deduct that investment interest on Schedule A to the extent you have investment income. 
Okay, so uh, that covers it for this tutorial. I hope that was helpful. Uh, if you have any questions, please leave me a comment below and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you.